hello and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us in a series, uh, for the second in the series, in a, a series of webinars called Freshly Certified. And this one today is going to be the Digital Design Edition. My name is Amanda Bolte, and I'm the Creative Director from CDM, or Cineplex Digital Media. I'm an RGD. I am currently serving as a member of the Certification Committee. I'm also a certification pres presentation reviewer. So I'm one of the people that get to look at all the pretty work as it comes in. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, if, um, if you have any questions for our presenters today, please use the question tab in our control panel. We will hold questions until the end of the, uh, end of the uh, presentations, so all the panels, uh, panelists are able to present. But if you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to um, add them to the questions tab, and I will, I will ask the panelists at the end of the presentations. Today's webinar is discussing RGD's certification process and the experience, but mainly focused around <clears throat> the case study development and the presentation. Our panel of recently certified RGDs today, Ben, Daniel, Joanna, and Neil, um, will be break, uh, working in the digital space and will be breaking down their, uh, their case studies and why they chose it, the process of putting it together and gathering the assets to, and to the results and how they chose to present it. But first, for those who are interested in the RGD certification process, let me just do a general introduction if you're not familiar with the process. Half a second, technical difficulties this morning. Um, through RGD, Canadian designers exchange ideas, educate and inspire, set professional standards, and build a strong, supportive community dedicated to advocating for the value of design. If you want more information about RGD, um, the resources are available for members um, or the larger design community events, please visit the uh, website at rgd.ca. There's so much information and valuable tools for there for members and for non-members alike. So today we're talking about certification. Uh, becoming an RGD is broken down roughly into four steps. There's a few other steps in there, but basically down to four steps. So filling out the application to see if you're eligible and what eligibility that you're, um, that you're, uh, you're able to um, to participate in. There's different. There's a RDD a certification, RDD senior a senior a seniority application as well. Um, but generally, seeing if you're eligible for the process. Um, there is an online test. Uh, the supply it is an open book test, and the materials are supplied to you. So we try to set you up for success. But there is an online test as well. Um, taking a virtual online portfolio review. Um, that's the fun part. That's uh, that's what we're talking about today. And the presentations, um, the presentations of the results from the RGD to see if you have passed or not. So as I said, our focus today is about the fun parts, in my opinion, because I love looking at design and I love looking at designers' work and, and talking to them about it. So the virtual online portfolio review, and this is where the designers get to be designers. So portfolios are presented virtually over 30 minutes to three senior design practi practitioners serving as RGD reviewers. Candidates present the same six pieces submitted as part of their RGD certifica certification application. So during the interview, during the review, you are asked to speak to all of the case studies within 30 minutes while going into depth about one of those six pieces. So I'm going to introduce our first reviewer. His name is Ben Wu. Ben is an experienced multimedia artist with over 10 years of experience, driven, driven technology with art. His skills include projection mapping, hologram interact, sorry, uh, hologram interactive <laughs> solutions, connected display, and he's able to apply innovative concepts to final solutions to improve user experience for the clients. Ben, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Amanda. No problem. So, um, so everyone can see my share screen. We sure can. Okay, okay. Uh, today I will talk about uh, the, uh, my project of the projection mapping night mm -hmm. show, and my client is FWD Life Insurance, mm -hmm. and I have completed this job in last year, and my duties are creative concept 
storyboard animation direction. And I worked with my uh, designer for the, this project. Okay. Uh, before I start uh, to talk about the, the details, I need to uh, uh, describe something about the projection mapping. Uh, the most challenging things uh, for the projection mapping is I need to um, think about the, the structure and the surface area of the building. Because if we have the different layers of the uh, building, my visual will be broken, like some uh, uh, text content will be hard to see. Okay, for, for example, like this, uh, you will see the, the front layer is uh, the yellow color and the back layer is a uh, red color. So I need to very uh, uh, take uh, attention to the different layers when I think about the layouts. Okay, before I start the job, I need to have the site visiting and test the projector in, the, uh, in front of the building. And after this, I need to uh, uh, make my hardware production like the, the stands for or, or the housing for the projectors because my um, installation is outdoor. So I need to uh, take care about the uh, waterproofing. And I need to uh, discuss with my designers and animators. For this job, I need to build many 3D models. And uh, before the, the demo, I need to uh, make my scale model. So uh, every time when I uh, see the preview or demo to my client, I need to bring this scale model to them and uh, project the, the, the image on that. So like this. Every time I need to uh, project on my scale model. And um, we take almost two weeks to set up the hardware. Uh, after this, I need to do the calibration for all of my projectors. This time I have used 12 high illumination projectors for this job. And this line showing the calibration. And this line is showing some uh, visual content of my uh, video. And there's some tricks for uh, projection mapping, like the, the uh, falling bricks. Uh, uh, we always need to um, uh, reform or transform or restructure the surface of the building. And sometimes I need to make some uh, artificial lighting uh, for the building. And uh, we put some, uh, for example, we, we put some uh, moving, dropping containers to make uh, the visual lights uh, uh, seems a uh, uh, perspective or like this. And uh, we need to think about the, the viewing angle of the audience. And sometimes we need to uh, set a point of the fake uh, perspective. Uh, and this, lay, uh, this slide showing uh, the way like uh, uh, showing building in building. And this slide, I show some uh, swimmer uh, in three lines to, to divide the three levels of the building. Uh, this slide, I show the, the kind of puzzle game, like uh, you will see uh, so many windows in the corridors. And, uh, and we put many uh, graphics of the, uh, of the human face uh, inside, inside this. 
And finally, we uh, put some uh, uh, dynamic graphics like uh, 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 fireworks, some uh, disco lighting. And uh, this is uh, all of my presentation. Thank you so much, Ben. That um, I found that really interesting. I think what your presentation said to me when I actually I was one of your reviewers, so that was excellent. Um, was really that uh, the out of the box thinking and and what graphic design is uh, applies to whether you know for the people who are presenting and that have content in their portfolios that aren't the typical logo and brochures, whereas these graphic design pieces that. Um, have different applications. I know myself and in my day-to-day -day business is that we work with a lot of screens and we work with projection mapping, not nearly to this scale, um, but uh, still a very different way of applying graphic design to the environment. And that's why I really appreciated your portfolio presentation. And I really invite, and I really was intrigued by the content and how you walk through the steps as well too. I think that was really important and it really showed us how your thought process went and how you created these um, these applications. All right, my dog's just left. It's like <laughs> the, the fun of working at home. So um, excellent. So next. Sorry, I'm very embarrassed. Um, so next up we have Daniel. So Daniel is going to, I'll introduce Daniel. Uh, Daniel Salaji, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Yes. Yeah, you um, got Daniel, it. <laughs> thank you. Um, Daniel is an award-winning and experienced interface and user experience designer and a member of the RGD um, of Canada. He is, <clears throat> he has worked in the industry for nearly a decade, starting in digital animation and transitioning into UX and UI working for various companies and studios along the way. He has worked in, on projects and uh, projects and products for the likes of Microsoft, Disney, Department of National Defense um, of Canada, USA Cycling, US Forestry, ADAP, ADP Canada, um, and so much more. He is uh, always delighted to end, uh, in creating intuitive and simple experiences and interactive interactions on products he has worked on and helped hundreds of thousands of people around North America. That was a mouthful, Daniel, and I can't wait to see what you've got. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Uh, definitely a pleasure to be here. Definitely a pleasure to be able to present today. Um, so my case study that I'm presenting today is the one that I did for Skyhive, which is a startup company here in Vancouver, Canada. Um, basically, uh, just to give you a rundown before I give into the actual case study and give some context, Skyhive itself is, like I said, a startup company here in Vancouver. They focus primarily on uh, recruitment and dig digitization of recruitment efforts. So you can think of them very similarly to a LinkedIn or an Indeed or ZipRecruiter of sorts. Uh, I had started there very early on during their initial phase. I was one of the first six members of the company and was the lead UX UI designer. Um, so yeah, my task was to basically develop the platform that is still ongoing to this day and can be used. Uh, and so through this case study, I'm just going to go through what uh, it really was. Uh, so one of our big um, problems and one of the big needs is obviously that there is a lot of um, sort of issues with, with traditional hiring and digital hiring. Uh, there's an enormous amount of time that takes to hire a successful candidate. Um, so one of Scott Hive's um, sort of issues to solve was how to increase the uh, short time to hire candidates um, by, you know, successful metrics. Um, we've noticed that obviously, uh, you know, now with the advent of technology, we're seeing this a lot more accelerated with COVID and working from home, obviously, is that uh, there's more need to, to hire people remotely and, and to work quickly. So these are some of the big problems that we were um, sort of consulting with and dealing with with the creation of the platform initially. Um, some of the strategies and the methodologies that we use is basically we wanted to under, to make sure people really understood their key uh, potential and their goals. Uh, one of the things I think people fail to realize is that their skills are transferable across uh, industries and even within industries. Just because you have a skill, um, you know, that's specific to an industry doesn't mean that it has to stay within that industry. 
So one of the goals and one of the strategies within SkyHive as well, and using the platform is to make people truly understand their actual potential to the world and to their employers and so on. Um, we also wanted to make sure that this was a natural fit for other areas. So one of the first things that we got into was uh, obviously more academia and uh, students and universities across Canada, uh, first here locally in Vancouver and then moving outwards towards the east. Um, as we saw the, uh, the adoption of the platform and sort of the product, uh, it became a natural fit and we kind of expanded from there. Uh, we started this obviously with initial uh, prototypes and so on. Uh, continuing on with this though, as, as we went along, uh, another one of our more lofty goals at the time was to obviously try to tackle uh, poverty and global unemployment, which is in and of itself quite a large task. Um, so one of the things that we tried to do is do things like upscaling, fostering, and stronger uh, worker relations. Uh, we use deep learning and AI uh, internally. We developed a very strong, um, strong learning system to be able to do these things. Uh, we also went to various events across Canada and North America, including the Ernst & Young Wavemakers event, uh, Collision in Toronto, uh, the C100, uh, Startup Grind, and various others to showcase our product, to have people user test it, and also to just get the, the word out. Um, our results and impacts, so over the course of a uh, year plus of, of my working there and working on this project, was, uh, as aforementioned, we ended up working with the Government of Canada and specifically the Department of National Defense, which was one of our first contracts. We secured a contract with National Sciences and Research Engineering Council, or NSERC, at Victoria, and we were admitted to Unreasonable Future uh, as a, a portfolio company as well as Singularity University. Uh, for those who don't know what those are, I highly encourage you to look them up. They are very uh, amazing organizations that deal with uh, large-scale uh, impact across the world. Uh, and lastly, also, we became a B Corporation, which is just a nicer uh, add-on to, to um, all our other accolades. Um, so, yeah, the acknowledgements and clients here, the people I worked with, uh, we were a small team, you know, 10, 15 people tops, uh, myself being UI UX, I worked with marketing, I worked with business development for uh, requirements and so on. Uh, and yeah, my duties involved uh, not only the UX design, but also the direction, art direction, planning, uh, creating the UI system and design libraries for both the uh, consumer platform and the enterprise platform as well, along with social media graphics and more. So I'm actually going to get into that and show um, show everyone sort of what are some of the steps uh, with that. Um, some of them were low low steps like this, which is just wireframings and user flows and, and figuring out um, how the process works. Uh, part of my presentation for the RGG certification, I wanted to really show those beginning steps, the thought processes, these sort of flows, and then get into uh, working with much more like low fidelity mockups and then some uh, final polished pieces as well. Also on top of giving all the uh, background context that it just went over uh, as well. I think that's important to frame the viewer's mind and really make sure that they understand what this application is, what does it do, who is it targeting, what are the problems, and then seeing the visuals that accompany that as well. Um, so you can see here it's a little small, but this is basically a user task flow for a worker. So this is someone who's coming into the platform who's looking for a job. Uh, you can see that this is basically something that they go through. So breaking down all the various steps and all the various jumping points that they can do, uh, whether they need to reset passwords, they need to log in. And this is just solidifying what the platform actually looks like and all and sort of the main high level feature uh, overviews that they can do. Uh, and again, this is something I developed with the team. We iterated upon uh, over the course of time of working and uh, continually kept uh, to polish. Um, now we're getting into some sort of low to mid fidelity uh, mockups here. And I wanted to really show these because these are really good examples of you know, starting points. Um, you know, a lot of the time, I think people focus in their presentations around just polished, finished work. But really, at the end of it, it is really interesting, at least for myself personally, you know, to see where something came from as well as where something ended up being. Uh, and I usually allude this to like when you see a drawing, for example, or a painting, it's really cool from my perspective to see the concepts and the thought process first and also see the final piece so I can understand that artist or designer's uh, you know, vision and what they were thinking as they were designing. So this is also why I include uh, these in my presentations. Um, so these are just various other screens. Basically, once you, you have a, a profile, once you have offers for jobs, and so on, you can see a bunch of different stats here and maps and so on. Um, so yeah, again, going back to the main point of the, the platform was to get uh, to get work from both sides, whether you're the employer or the employee. Um, so we tried to uh, account for both of those designs. 
And then as well mentioned, uh, the last couple of screens here are just basically what those polished uh, final pieces look like. You can see the big yellow banner that says beta. So this was very early on that we released. Uh, and this is what we released with uh, and then kept continuing to refine uh, this product as we move forward. But basically this is what it ended up looking like. Uh, if you were signing up to use this product back in uh, 2018, uh, into maybe early 2019, you would have probably seen something like this uh, from us uh, at this point. Uh, and yeah, these are just additional screens. You have your dashboard screen, uh, payments setting screen, for example, to to pick uh, a pricing. And this the pricing was always for uh, companies looking to hire someone and not for people looking for work. Uh, so that's something we intentionally did. Uh, and then here, and I just have a couple of the social media graphic examples. Um, just to showcase some of the other additional work that I did. Uh, and lastly, just to sort of comment on that, uh, yeah, when you're in a startup, you do wear multiple hats. Um, so that was another thing I wanted to kind of share and to say that while I am a UX UI designer, I also do other uh, tasks and jobs outside of that, including graphic design and, um, you know, multimedia work uh, as well. So yeah, that, that's basically uh, my presentation. Hopefully that wasn't uh, too fast and was uh, fairly clear there. No, that was excellent, Dana. Thank you so much. Um, again, I, I agree with you. I love seeing the the thought process, the background. Like it really puts the design in context. And and when you're selling that sometimes to clients or you're selling something to your creative director or um, you know, etc., is really walking through the process and understanding how you got it and and how it was designed and why. Um, you know, starting with that why or starting with the user, the you know, the user path or the customer journey, so to speak whether it's whether it's online or in person or anything like that really understanding that is really important to the process so thank you for bringing that I, I really enjoyed it thank you um, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that Nopia has a question or two for that because I think that that was great um, I okay so thank you next up we have Joanna G so Joanna is a, a senior user experience designer with critical mass at Apple she was born and raised in Canada, currently residing in the Bay Area, and she spends a majority of her time explaining the magic of ketchup chips to her American friends, and I love that. Taking slow walks and telling jokes. I'm sure that they can't wrap their heads around ketchup chips. Um, her eight plus years of work experience span across multiple clients and projects including e-commerce, product design and service design. She loves doing what she does and what, what which is to think that about people, think about other people and create beautiful and functional experiences for them. Joanna, I can't wait to see your presentation. Thanks, Amanda. Um, hey guys, um, most American friends actually do like ketchup chips, which is really nice. <laughs> they always want me to bring some back home. Um, so I'm going to talk through um, one of my case studies, obviously for you guys. Um, so the first one I'm actually gonna do is the Apple checkout redesign that I was a part of. Um, I just wanted to give you guys some context. I picked this one because I personally think it's the crown jewel of my career. So it felt important to bring in something that I felt extremely proud of. Additionally, there was a ton of other reasons why I wanted to use this one in my presentation. Um, Apple is a pretty recognizable name. It's pretty easy to just get what the problem is. It was a pretty massive effort, so I really wanted to make sure I was conveying my capabilities as a designer because it's designing for scale. Um, I think it's a good end-to-end -end story um, with a happy ending, spoiler alert, and it was a really great example of collaboration, and I knew that I would enjoy talking about it, which is why I wanted to do this one. Um, I wanted to give some context of how I put this together. Um, as they say in the lovely show, Great British Bake Off, you can never have a cake that is just style or just substance. You have to have both. And so that's how I approached this portfolio. The first thing I did was just really define a design framework, which meant um, laying out a grid, figuring out a type system, really defining what brand I was, and then creating page templates that would work across all of my different case studies. And then I think from everybody else who has presented, it's really about story building. Um, what's gonna be succinct? How do I get the message across? How do I show my contributions and the effects of what actually we worked on? And then the last thing was powerful visuals, which I'm sure you guys all know is how you buy uh, mock-ups for iPhones and laptops, um, how you source imagery. I had to resize so many, so many images. Um, so I'll take you through it right now. Um, as you know, Apple is one of the largest companies in the world. I had the pleasure of working there through CM. Um, it's regarded as one of the world's most valuable brands. And what I got to work on was their checkout redesign. 
So as you can imagine, now with COVID, you have a lot of time to online shop. And the checkout experience is pretty important to that process. And it's really integral to any online shopping experience. And for Apple, this project was really about how we reimagine that checkout process to be as beautiful, as contextual, and as seamless as the rest of the site had become without changing the core backend architecture. So it was a really big front end effort. The goal was to really change the way that people buy from Apple and to make the experience of actually purchasing just as gratifying as owning a product. And so my particular role was I was a UX designer. I was responsible for coming up with solutions that were thoughtful and detailed. Um, and also document that stuff. I collaborated with a ton of people um, to understand business and user goals and also just develop solutions from that. It was my job to really understand the complexities and make sure that I was accounting for all of them. And my team was four UX designers, four usual visual designers, one copywriter and three ACDs helped us as well. So just to give you guys context, um, this is kind of the existing checkout at that time, super dated in terms of design compared to the rest of the website. Um, they had used kind of like this one pager um, with the accordions basically. So as you went through each step, then another kind of accordion would open up. So super dated compared to the rest of the site, if you guys have seen it. And so what our approach was when we were tackling this problem was really just about working nimbly and effectively cross-functionally because there's a lot of players at hand when you're talking about a company as big as Apple. So what we did from the get-go was actually define core like strategic and experience principles. So those were simple, clear, scalable, forward-thinking. And that was really to serve as that like North Star um, to make sure we were just designing with Apple standards in mind. And so, as you can imagine, like there's a lot of complexities when it comes to something like checkout. Specifically, checkout has to be different for every single country and customer. So that means a ton of different contextual, um, different use cases that needed to be addressed on every single decision point. And so to solve that complexity, what we did was actually de we developed a modular design system. And so that was so that we can make an experience super intuitive and seamless, and those elements could be repurposed across the experience. And then lastly, as I said, there's a lot of players at Apple, so we had to collaborate pretty much every week with different cross-functional teams. So that meant like the Apple Pay team, the iCloud team, product teams, as well as engineering. So this is kind of like a high level overview of the core flow. I think the biggest thing that we did change is that instead of having the one pager, we actually decided to kind of adjust checkout to be a multi-page experience. And I think the purpose of that was really to make sure that we were serving people focus so that they could just focus on one thing at a time as they moved on. I think that was really important, especially because um, there's just a lot of stuff to go through when you're checking out. And it's a pretty expensive thing you're probably buying. So we wanted to make sure it was as comprehensive as possible. So from that, it's really, you know, you go to the bag, you guys have probably seen this stuff, you do a what we call fulfillment, which is, do you want it delivered? Do you want to pick it up? Um, and then we go into the shipping page, the payment page, and then reviewing everything is good to go. And then that thank you moment where you're all done. So I'm going to zoom in to a couple of pages specifically just to talk about them. Um, with the shipping page, you probably think this is a boring page and you just want to get over it. Um, and we kind of felt the same, but it's really a tactical moment in the checkout flow because people are wanting to quickly enter their information, but also make sure that it's accurate because they want to get their stuff and then just move on with the transaction. So this is really key because this is the first moment in the checkout experience where you can actually put in your personal information and where you can actually save your information. So this is where like being signed in or having user authentication was really important. And so the success of this page really hindered on people feeling confident that they had entered their stuff um, accurately, were, was able to edit and save their personal information. And for us, it's crazy how much time we spent on this kind of stuff. Um, we spent probably over three weeks just going through a ton of different iterations on it. And it was really about consolidating and cons like categorizing the entry field into a really simple narrative and just pre-populating where we could and just really simplifying this page as much as possible. Um, to make it a little bit more complex, um, customers could be sending this anywhere. So we need to make sure that even though there were similar form fields, we needed to make sure that they were um, there was text next to it to add um, context so they knew what they were doing in each of these places. And there's a ton of different states, so I want to show you those, those ones. So imagine you're actually signed in. There's a little bit of a different experience because we actually pull in your information from the, your Apple ID. So there's that's one on the left. 
And then we actually did a um, kind of variation for China. It's very specific to China, which is that they actually need to select their province, city, and as well as their district. So we had to make sure we were accommodating for that. And one thing that is unique to China is that they have something called a FAPIAO. It's kind of this unique invoice that they need to do, need to have potentially for taxing. So we need to incorporate that as well. One of the other pages was the thank you. I think a lot of people think that the thank you page is kind of like this throwaway page, but it became clear that we were kind of underutilizing the thank you page and it felt like a dead end. So this was a really fun page to work on just because it has the opportunity to, to serve as like a springboard to just continue that conversation with Apple. Not only do we get to celebrate that you just spent a lot of money for us, um, but we also wanted to make sure we were providing clear steps and also re-engaging the customers to know that, you know, you're not just getting one product, you're, you know, joining the Apple ecosystem. So that's kind of how we represented it here. There's obviously a ton of different states here too. So I just wanted to quickly show that. Um, there's a program at Apple called the iPhone Upgrade Program. So we had to make sure that that was unique to that customer. Um, if you actually wanna pick up, there's specific information related to that. And if you actually haven't signed in, but you can recognize your, um, your email, they'll try to make sure we can link your order so you can track it um, a little bit better. And then lastly, um, this is merchandising. A lot of people, um, at Apple obviously want to merchandise, whether or not it's cross-selling different products or services, adding on uh, Apple Care, or um, just giving value propositions to really like sell the idea of purchasing on apple.com. Um, what I was tasked to do was really define a merchandising system and strategy to work across all of these pages. And what we wanted to do is make sure it's really flexible so that it is um, easy to place different merchandising from the cross merchandising team, but also there needed to be rules actually put in place because we didn't want any kind of merchandising person to overtake any certain page because we wanted to stay, to stay pure to the values of why we redesigned this. So here are some example pages, um, you probably can't see, but basically we actually had to break down like every single page, what was the goal of merchandising on it, where we would place it and actually inventory the types of merchandising that could exist. So for example, on Bag, it's really to help users understand like what their promotions are available, um, all that kind of good stuff. And so what we did was we actually annotated where those placements could exist, but we also put rules as to where um, and when to use them just because they, we didn't want people to go crazy. So here's the merchandising system live on BAG. You can kind of see there's kind of like this little um, module that people can use to um, present extra information. And um, I guess quickly the results, um, due to confidentiality, I can't say um, statistical results, but they have been ex extremely positive. Conversion has increased on web and mobile. It was amazing that this like small team of people um, really helped define what it meant to check out in US and China. And it's getting uh, launched out to other countries as well. And the team was really given space to dive into each use case, um, think about every single detail. And it's nice because I think what we've built has been like future proof basically. And it performed particularly well because the Baynard Institute highlighted that it's kind of like a state of the art experience, which is awesome. I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, I've spent a, a stupid amount of money with Apple, so I appreciate um, the user process. I think that I, I, I love that you really delve into understanding the customer experience and understanding you know, where the problems were and how to fix those as well too. Um, and uh, working with an insane amount of people is always a challenge. So um, that's great. I thank you so much for that. Um, I did wanna say something too, um, just in general, is uh, for through, through the uh, uh, RGD process and through the portfolio process, I'm sure that that was your one big one that you kind of really delve into and I can see completely why, like I probably would have done the exact same thing. Um, the other the other case studies that you presented, I'm sure that you didn't spend nearly as much time on that, like uh, talking about them. It was tough, like, cause you know, obviously there's like different types of work. Like I had done some branding work as well for some like small, like random things. And it was like, okay, well it's not as, 
it, not technically as complex, but I still wanted to tell the same story. But I think I built those out to be more visual than it was more like text heavy. Um, for the presentation, actually, I stripped a lot of that down um, because that's just really something you should voice over. I just wanted to show the actual case study. But yeah, you can't you can't technically like go as into detail. And I didn't like it's tough because like when your like case study starts being 80 pages, you're like, oh, like I got to <laughs> stop at some point. So I think this is the one where I was like, okay, let's start strong and then like let's just make a little bit more of the succinct ones later on. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, next up, we have Neil. So this is our last present uh, presenter for today. So Neil um, uh, comes with us uh, with an aptitude for clean and effective design. He threads his keen sensibility for user-centered design through all phases of his work by marrying the fundamental pr principles of design and practice uh, understanding of user experience. He consistently drives functionality between uh, beautiful experiences for diverse brands across North America. Everybody's giving me these really great big words with their presentations today. Um, with a firm background in print and media design and professional experience in brand, web, and user experience design, Neil has established himself as a truly multidisciplinary designer. Neil, the floor is yours. Ah, amazing. Great. <laughs> Can everyone see? Yep. I think so. Yes. Uh, okay. Good. Hi, everyone. My name is Neil. Thank you, Amanda, for that uh, that introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, today, I'll be taking a look at the Holiday More Awareness Tour, which was a project that came to us um, a little while ago, and we delivered it actually back in February of 2019. And my role in the project was to be the project coordinator as well as the senior digital experience designer. So the, the Canada Ukraine Foundation came to us with an outline for a traditional paper and PowerPoint based lesson that was designed to raise awareness and teach high school students across Canada about the Holodomor, which was a, um, a genocidal famine in 1930s Ukraine. And, and our task with this lesson was to modernize and elevate this traditional classroom lesson and transform it into a modern and engaging interactive educational experience. And uh, no project is complete without a good challenge. And in our case, this one uh, was to have this whole experience be completely self-sufficient and completely contained within this fully functioning RV. And the idea here was that this lesson would travel between high schools uh, across Canada and they'd be able to actually host the lesson on, on the bus. And in terms of case study design, I do tend to try to keep my um, initial introductions fairly short. So when I review portfolio presentations, I prefer to see introductions where the client's ask is stated clearly and upfront without a leading hero image of the work itself. Uh, I do this because I find that sometimes too many images up front can really distract from the chance you have to build that narrative and provide the necessary context for your reviewer uh, that they would then need to make sense of the work that you present a little bit later on. So um, this is more specific to presented work, more so than actual print and web-based portfolios, but it's just something that I wanted to mention kind of up front. In order to make sure that we truly address the unique challenges of any new project, we always conduct a discovery session or, or what we call discovery. For this project, we sought to understand what the uh, the, the sensitive and unique um, subject of the Hall of More was before we dove into the specifics of audience challenges and desired outcomes. This really was a very unusual subject for us to work with, so we we wanted to make sure that we understood uh, the gravity of what it is that we were we were working on. And here are just a few images to show what the what that actually what that looked like. Um, these orienting conversations really helped to instill a sense of respect and responsibility for the work that we were doing and the role that we as designers would play in telling telling this story, as you see on the the story being the the whole little more telling it uh, respectfully and and accurately. During these sessions, we also learned from the educator that in her experience as a teacher, we would need to be mindful that students will have a hard time focusing for the entire duration of this hour long lesson. So between the limitations of that RV that I showed, this sensitive subject and the challenge of keeping students focused, we set out to create an engaging experience and one that would really pull students out of simply like passively ingesting information like in a more traditional classroom setting and into a more active engagement with um, where, where the lesson materials are, are interacted with a little bit more actively. So initially to address this issue of immersion, we clad one side of this bus uh, with the inside, uh, inside we clad it with the matrix of displays. And here we had 12 displays set along one side of the bus. And here you can see the, the, the chairs that the students would sit in was actually positioned fairly close uh, within that, that, that volume. 
So to help keep students engaged and to inspire an emotional response, we designed these larger than life emotion, motion graphics and immersive soundscapes that would play on that big screen that I just showed on the previous slide. So in person, the sheer scale and the impressive movement and the accompanying music pr provided that, uh, that immersive feeling that we were, we were looking for. Um, taking a step back here. So it's always tricky to decide between whether or not you should include video in your proposals and your presentations. So this over video conference like this one, you can't always guarantee that the uh, video will be received by your recipient on the other end um, cleanly and smoothly, or if it'll play well. Um, in this case, I decided to include a little snippet here because it's important to understand that all the statics and the images that I'm showing were all actually animated and moving in the actual live experience. So even if this isn't super smooth, it does provide a bit of a hint um, and it plans to seed in the reviewer's mind that, hey, these, these statics that I'm presenting are actually animated. So as part of our primary task to modernize and enhance this paper learning experience and keep the students focused, we designed an interactive learning activity that ran on iPads. And this is just an in-situ shot showing how close the students were sitting to the screen, how big the screen was, and uh, actually them having the iPads that had this activity on it uh, that had this in, in hand. This activity was called the Historian's Craft, and it would put students in the role of historian, where they were tasked with digging through various historical artifacts uh, from the Holiday Moor for information that they would use to answer a series of short response questions. And this activity was designed to pair with the content being played on that big screen. So you'll see on the slide here, uh, the top banner is what would be on the big screen, and then the student's iPad uh, would work in concert with that. And I'll, I'll pause here for a second as well and point out that um, this slide showing the actual work and the previous slide showing students working on their iPads acted as an intentional pivot between setting up the context and talking a bit more specifically about the work itself. Um, from a case study narrative standpoint, you would generally spend a few slides setting up your background that the reviewer needs to make sense of your work before actually showing it. And this, this really was a chance to kind of pivot from one to the other. Um, again, this works a little bit differently when you're presenting something verbally um, versus something uh, that you would do in a, in a printed portfolio. So to aid in capturing the attention of the students and instill a sense of authenticity and role play, I wanted things to feel a little bit more tactile and real. So with this in mind, I decided to go with a more schemorphic approach, meaning that I used these, uh, I used design elements and features mimicking real world objects to set dress this interface and make it look a bit like a historian's office or, or maybe like a museum room or like a, a library. And because this desk environment mimicked real life, interaction was really intuitive. Students could tap on these artifacts and seek information that would help them answer their assigned questions. Now, remember when students will be handed an iPad and be expected to use the iPad to perform the activity right away. So there really wasn't a lot of onboarding time. Um, so I had to design the interface in such a way that it would be easy to pick up, understand, and use. And interestingly, during user testing, we found that uh, quite a few students had actually never used an iPad before. And that really became a solid reminder to me and the rest of the team that, hey, you need to get your work out in front of people as quickly and as often as you can, learn from them, and then uh, make adjustments to your design to adjust for any challenges that they, may, they might face. And in this case, we actually found that the schemorphic approach really helped those students to quickly pick up and start using the iPad right away. And in this case, I just included an image um, of the actual user testing session that we ran. Well, we ran a few, but this is just one of them. And this just helps to sort of substantiate what it is that I'm, that I'm talking about uh, on the slide. The bulk of my research time went into literature review and consulting with the staff at the Canada Ukraine Foundation to make sure that all the actual historical artifacts, so these little paper snippets you see on the left um, in the screenshot were, were accurate. So thinking back to that initial discovery session that we had back at the start, we learned that the Holodomor more was, and in many ways still is very much a highly political subject. So we couldn't just pull content from anywhere and assume that it was correct. Everything had to be, had to be vetted. So throughout project development, I had to remember that my role as a professional designer was not only to achieve the aims of the brief and to create a beautiful experience, but to also pause and ensure that I was respectful and accurate in the work that I was doing. So to that end, there was definitely a bit of a, a design ethics um, component at work here. The student activity became an immensely engaging experience for the students who really embodied the role as historians. 
the idea to use an almost interactive museum-like experience as a teaching tool really helped the students to maintain their focus while learning about this critical moment in, in history. And for us, it was really awesome to hear from the teachers and the school administrators that they loved this lesson's ability to achieve that original aim of creating, creating a truly modern interpretation of, that, uh, of a traditional classroom lesson. And thankfully, <laughs> Uh, due to the success of this uh, now, I suppose now multiple award-winning lesson, the Canada-Ukraine Foundation contra contracted us again to develop a second lesson called Breaking the Sound Barrier. And in this case, the subject was still the Holodomor, but it dealt with a more journalistic and political aspect of the Holodomor history. Um, the name Breaking the Sound Barrier is actually a reference to this veil of silence and censorship that was put in place around the Ukraine and Holodomor itself so that the world couldn't find out about it. And in this lesson, we talk about how the journalists worked to break that barrier of silence and bring the truth of the Holodomor to, to the rest of the world. And it was a very, very interesting story. So with these more mature themes in mind, I saw an opportunity to use darker aesthetics and more muted tones to bring the subject to life. And this was really in contrast to that first one, which had a bit more um, vibrant um, aesthetics. So I'll just show a couple of slides here to show how the, the risks that we took and the lessons that we learned um, and the interaction design and approach that we established during the first lesson really uh, helped to inspire even greater success in its, its sequel. This was a really, actually, really, really cool project to work on. And now, given the current state of COVID, um, we've been asked to bring the original Holodomor lesson to the web where students can actually uh, engage with these materials and learn about the Holodomor from, from home. Um, so that's it. I will leave you with a final thought. I'll just make a quick point, and um, Joanna kind of touched on it before, but um, you'll notice that for this particular presentation, I didn't delve too much into the process or the design or the aesthetics of the experience that I designed. Some of the other case studies that I presented uh, in my review actually dealt with those aspects a little bit more specifically. Um, Instead, because this project had some nuance and interesting challenges associated with it, I felt that it would be a good opportunity to speak to some of those other intangibles that you would be, you'd be reviewed on as well. So in this case, I spoke a bit more about the ethics of design and the responsibility of a professional designer. So just keep in mind that you have, you'll be presenting six pieces at five minutes each. So you won't have time to really delve into like every aspect of every phase of every project. Um, Instead, you can really spread all of that information across your case study so that between all of them, you cover all aspects of your professional experience. So in other words, one case study could focus a bit more on ethics, one a bit more on design research, one a bit more on accessibility and so on. Uh, of course, there'll be a lot of overlap, but you can kind of focus and tailor each one to speak to something a bit more specific as well. Um, you know, except for all looking at six of exactly the same thing, those get kind of boring. So this way you do kind of keep things a bit interesting and present an overall, uh, across the 30 minutes, present an overall more holistic presentation. Um, anyway, on that on that note, that's it for me. I hope you, um, you learned something from my approach to case study design and I wish everybody well on, uh, on your reviews as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. That was great. I think what was most important too that uh, you touched on at the very beginning was um, how you set up the case study and how you kind of worked it through. I like, um, I think that um, what is most important for that too is really creating a case study that you feel comfortable with working your way through, as in creating your own script and really understanding the process on how you started and how you went, how, like, how those steps were for you as a designer. And um, I think that's a really great way of basing it. I know that every project is very different. Um, design is a big world um, so it may not apply to all projects or all applications of design but I think that I think that's a good takeaway to really to create that case study based on your experience and how you approach the program and kind of how it ended so thank you for that I really appreciate that awesome thank you very much yeah so um uh, Abdul I don't know if we can get everybody up I have a do have a few questions um just uh for for the group um just uh i'm gonna I'll, I'll start with neil because he's in front of me <laughs> um was there any challenges throughout this whole process on creating uh, creating your case studies or becoming certification certified like right from the get from right from the start and and how did you work through those um yeah the, the rgd actually does a really good job of outlining sort of the steps and providing you with the resources you need to to be successful in this the certification process so the website actually is a really good resource for that 
Um, so for me, the biggest challenge was actually just condensing everything I wanted to say into 30 minutes. I think that was really, really challenging. So um, I spent a, quite a bit of time actually tweaking and adjusting and making my my presentations kind of work as, as five minute little segments. Um, and then really just practicing that with other people as well. If I found that as if, if I just presented it in my head, I ended up taking an hour to present everything. Uh, whereas if I'm presenting to somebody else, I immediately see, oh crap, I actually have to like shorten this piece or do this or like adjust how I'm presenting a piece to make it make a bit more sense and make it fit within within the five minutes. So overall, I think that was probably the biggest challenge for me was just condensing it all. Uh, we like to talk about our work, so. <laughs> we do like to talk about time. our work. Everybody kind of does, right? And we feel so passionate about it and want to make sure that we're checking off those boxes. Yeah. So during the review process, during the portfolio presentations, and it is a presentation, it's not so much a review. So the the, pres the reviewers are, are like, well, it is a review, yeah. So, but um, it's more of a, we're, we're there to, you're there to present your work and, and it's not a job presentation. It's not a job uh, review or a interview or anything like that. So it is that kind of, of kind of <laughs> sorry Daniel you're muted I <laughs> he's talking <laughs> okay um yeah no so it's it is something that you have to present you have to kind of you have to kind of practice a little bit beforehand um but during the process it's uh you know you have 30 minutes to present six and you really only have to go into depth into one of those five or one of those six um during that 30 minutes so the other as as Neil was saying that other five um uh, portfolio pieces that you're presenting, you really only have a short amount of time to kind of go through. Um, Joanna, was there any any challenges for you uh, during the process? Because you're out of out of Canada, and, like in another country at the moment. But um, oh man, I think what Neil said, the timing is, was the trickiest because I like I, I like to riff, so that means there's timing con like problems with that. Um, I think also just not knowing exactly what to go into like you just never know what your presenters are gonna like care about and until like after <laughs> um so i think it was really just like trusting that like what you're saying was true and that like it it made a like holistic story or like it made a cohesive story was like the most important you just had to trust that um mm -hmm. because you just didn't know like what presenters you were going to get and like what they might be looking into awesome um, ben, uh, what was the certification process like for you? Did you, um, was it easy? Was it, uh, was there any challenges as well? Like talk about your certification process. All right. Uh, for me, I think that is not um, quite easy for me because I think that the most challenge for me is the presentation skill. Um, especially I, my English uh, speaking skill is not good enough sometimes. So uh, it, it, even I, I think that uh, it's uh, quite hard to um, present for around 20 to 30 minutes, uh, uh, especially in Chinese. It is very hard for me, but uh, uh, this time is, uh, I, I use English to, to, to present. So I think that uh, it made me so nervous. Well, you know what? The way I look at it, anybody who speaks more than one language, which I don't, never needs to apologize. So you, I think you did fantastic. Um, I, you know, the reviewers are really there to. We want to see you succeed. We want to understand your uh, understand your work, and I think that um, I think that uh, that's something to take away. Like we're we're there to to see everybody succeed, and we really we really want to see the best of kind of what's coming through from people. So, Ben, I, I you know English isn't your first language, and you know what? You don't need to apologize for that ever, <laughs> right? Um, uh, Daniel, uh, what has uh, how has the RGD benefit you? benefited you since you um uh since you've become certified um for me personally i've just it's a great community like i think you mentioned in the in the beginning uh, there's a lot more benefits to it than just going through that membership process and, and doing your case study presentations and so on um there's a very vibrant community there's a lot of uh, interactions i mean obviously we just had um a huge round of those uh webinars and other things that happened in the, in the previous weeks. I was actually a, a speaker for one of them, which was uh, really engaging. It was good to see people coming in and asking questions similar to this, where um, people were like, well, you know, wh what do you do for accessibility design? How do you do this? How do you do that? What do you think about 
So that, I think that's great. Um, I'm a big proponent of trying to give back to the community too. So um, for me, I thought that was awesome to be able to go ahead and be a part of that as a, as a speaker and speak on behalf of design and, and help out uh, other people. Um, I think it's great to have that membership uh, community as well. There's the Slack channel where you can basically post questions or work or help. Um, I know I, I'm not right at that point this second where I'm going to fully utilize that, but I know in the future with some of the work that I'm doing, um, it would be great to have other designers from various backgrounds look at some of the design stuff I'm doing and maybe give some feedback and do a little bit of user testing with me. So I think that in itself is a huge benefit just to have an access to a network uh, you know, across the country and elsewhere that can you can reach out to and speak to, um, you know, for people looking for work. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 fully employed, so I'm I'm quite happy. But I know a lot of other designers in the field who are looking for work, and I know that people on my channel share uh, posting. So I think that's also super helpful and useful as well. Um, and then yeah, just being up to date. Um, there's some things that you know I I don't have time to research and know about. So it's great to have that constant news feed coming in and, and sharing like, did you read this? Do you know about this? Here's a book you should check out. Uh, I think all those things are incredibly useful as well. So, awesome! Thank you so much. You know, we're almost we're actually almost right on our time. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, please reach out uh, if you are looking for more information on the certification process. Um, I know all of our presenters today have uh, um, are reachable through um, through RGD um, as well to answer any questions. If you would like to know more about their work or if you have any, any specific questions that you want to talk to them about themselves. If you would like to more and know more information on the certification process, either email Heidi Berry at, uh, uh, and her information is available on the website as well. Um, uh, I know I'm on all socials if you need to reach out to me as well. Um, you know, uh, the design community is something that it is very, um, we are pack animals, we, we feed off of each other, and uh, this community is just growing and growing and growing. So thank you for all of my, uh, all of my contributors as well today. Um, there's going to be another, um, another one of these uh, in a series, so Freshly Certified, um, in January, so keep a lookout for that invite and share it along because as always always free so thank you so much everybody today and have a great weekend great thanks everyone yep. you guys as well